really fortunate to have a group for this next part that really literally represents the front lines in uh, making the internet access and freedom a human rights issue. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ethan Zuckerman of the Berkman Center to moderate the discussion. And he'll be joined by Brett, who you've already met, Solana Larson, uh, who is from Global Voices, Dwai Hong, and John Palfrey, who you've also met earlier today. So, welcome to the stage. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I think one of the things we've learned today is that uh, Jenny has an amazing ability to bring unexpected and wonderful people into this room. Uh, one of the things that I also didn't realize is that she has amazing control over world affairs. Uh, because if you think about the timing of this discussion, it's really hard to imagine a moment in time where it's better to have a conversation about the importance of a free and open internet, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Uh, we are quite literally at a pivotal moment uh, I was in between our wonderful lunch speakers glancing at my iPhone and trying to keep track uh, not just of the successful revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia, but nascent revolutions uh, literally going on not just through the entire Arab world, uh, but as far away as places like Gabon. And these are places where the net is deeply non-neutral, uh, which is to say that the people who are trying to use the internet to do what people in Sidi Bouzid, a dusty town in central Tunisia of 40,000 people, where people took to the streets, uh, an incredibly brave act, and then documented their actions, putting it online on Facebook and on other social networks, where Al Jazeera, banned from reporting in that country, picked up the story and started amplifying it back to the Tunisian people, allowing this protest movement to move from this small, small town across the whole country. We're watching people take these incredible actions in parts of the world where it's frankly incredibly difficult in many cases to get access to the internet or to get access in a way that is open, fast, or safe. So we've got a remarkable group of people here who are gonna help us sort through these issues of what it means to use this internet which is far from as open as we would like it to be in the places that we're talking about to have access to democracy and political change. And so I want to introduce these folks, but actually Jenny has asked me to make some slight changes in this, just in the spirit of the thing. So directly on my left, we have uh, John Palfrey, my uh, former boss, quite possibly the best one I've ever had, at Harvard Law School, um, who is going to be talking a little bit about uh, his work researching uh, the free and open internet. And as I understand it here, he's also juggling, correct? Sorry. So um, <laughs> we also have uh, to Sorry, his left uh, Zui Wang uh, with Viet Thanh, uh, which is a political party and dissident organization in Vietnam uh, committed to peaceful democratic change. I understand you're also playing the accordion. Uh, right. You've met Brett Solomon uh, with Access, an organization that's working incredibly hard uh, to figure out how to give people access around the world uh, to the free and open internet. Uh, and he's also going to be growing John Hodgman's mustache. And uh, Solana Larson on the very end is the managing editor of Global Voices, uh, an international citizen media organization that I'm proud to be the chairman of. And as I understand this, Jenny, do you have this right? Um, Solana is live on stage, uh, going to be selling Global Voices to AOL for $350 million. <laughs> so that's fantastic news. And I'm I'm thrilled to hear that, and I, I'm sure everyone in this room who's generously supported us in the past uh, is happy to hear that too, and don't worry, you will get your share. Um, <laughs> as we start this conversation, I want to turn first to John, who's done some of the best research in this field on the spread of internet censorship around the world. So John, give us a sense just how free and open the net is in countries outside the US and, and how that trend is changing over time. Thank you, Ethan. Um, so when we started, being involved in the internet, I don't know, 15 years ago, the sort of uh, broad public internet discussion, I think the initial conversation was the idea that the internet itself was free and open, that it was in fact the World Wide Web. And the discussion was actually, was it possible to regulate the net? There was actually this discussion, is it regulable, this weird word. And I think we've gotten to a point, fast forwarding to today, that it's not, is it regulable, it's, is, is it more or less regulable than real space? So the story that I think is important to tell over the course of the, uh, that period is we've gone from a situation in which the internet was this broad worldwide network to one that actually is very different from places 
place to place in terms of what you can access. So um, starting about 10 years ago, a, a consortium of us in various universities, uh, in particular the University of uh, Toronto Citizen Lab and a group called SecDev in Canada, started to study what could you see on the net if you were in other places. And back in 2002, 2003, there really were about two places, a small handful of places, China and Saudi Arabia, paradigmatically, where the state actually blocked access to certain sites on the internet. Um, what we've seen in the course of the last decade is a growth from those two states to something more like four dozen states. So if you think about the places in which the state actually chooses what you can and cannot see, ranging from a few sites to uh, a very many sites that are being blocked, um, and most re remarkably in the context of some instances, like in Egypt, we saw, of course, that a state that wasn't blocking all that much of the internet um, in the moment of crisis decided with six phone calls from the president to shut down the entire network. So um, if you think about it, we've gone from a situation in which the internet itself was thought to be a relatively free space to one where the restrictions have grown over time. And if I might actually flip one more slide just to give you a sense of where um, internet censorship looks more or less today, um, we can map internet censorship around the world in various ways. This map shows from the Open Net Initiative data recently where things that are socially uh, sensitive are getting blocked around the world. And the darker the color, uh, the darker the, um, uh, the greater the amount of, uh, of filtering. If you go to the Open Net Initiative site, you can also see uh, political blocking or different tools getting blocked and so forth. Um, I think one important thing to note about this is that while most of the filtering goes on in uh, Middle East and North Africa, obviously we're talking about that, um, the, uh, the East Asia region where uh, we'll hear more about Vietnam, but China has been the 800 pound gorilla, um, but also in uh, the former Soviet states, um, the filtering when you're talking about socially um, sensitive things actually happens in the West as well. So I want to make the argument too that even though the state has come to known to be uh, blocking things that are politically sensitive, we also do blocking. And you'll note the United States is lit up here. So why is the United States lit up for technical internet filtering? Sure enough, in ISPs, if you're at your home, uh, Comcast isn't doing much blocking of you know, particular sites, um, although there's obviously the net neutrality discussion. Um, but what is happening is that in schools and libraries and so forth, we plainly do um, filtering for things we're worried about kids seeing. I would also put in that bucket all of the other kinds of filtering, corporate filtering, for instance, that's happening in workplaces. Um, if you expand to a conversation about distributed denial of service attacks, the instances in which certain sites get brought down um, in order to make people not see them at some sensitive moment, we usually have been talking about the growth of that in other countries in moments leading up to elections. We now have a conversation about whether or not that's happened in the WikiLeaks context. And I think there are real questions about the United States government and its role in this, uh, in this particular context. So I think the basic trajectory here is one where the uh, censorship has gone from a few states, ones that one would have guessed don't have great human rights records and so forth, to a very widespread practice that it's happening not just in, uh, in sc uh, scope and scale in that way, but increased sophistication. And then it happens at many, many layers in the network, and you get private actors into the mix as well. So it's not just China. It's not just Saudi Arabia. It's not just happening at a national level. It's sometimes happening at the level of a school or a university or a corporation. <coughs> And we often analyze this in terms of choke points, uh, possible spots on the network where traffic can be controlled or choked off in one fashion or another. Brett, you were talking before this in this demo about some of the tools that we use to try to get around state level filtering. But I know that at the moment, you're also very concerned about how US corporations also can be involved with controlling access to content in one fashion or another. And you're focusing your efforts with access, not just on helping people get around the firewall, but on ensuring that they're actually able to use these tools in a way that allows them to be a, a functioning yeah. digital public sphere. I mean, <clears throat> the, I mean it's not, it is about corporations. And I'm, I think at Access, we're really interested in the engagement between um, <clears throat> you know, private companies um, and the positive effect that they can have on you know, on people's political participation and quest for social justice. I mean, we just need to look at Facebook, for instance, and see, you know, the seismic changes that have come about um, partly, and there's a debate as to how much, but as a result of people's ability to be able to mobilise on a private platform. Um, and, but I think there are kind of three levels. I, I was trying to think about it this morning. There are, there are companies that are taking positive um, de deliberative positive actions, like for instance Facebook, but I would also put them in the second category as well, which is kind of 
the blind, the turning a blind eye to the capacity and, and the role that they play. I mean, in a sense, human, um, Facebook is really on the front line of social change and human rights defence, but is kind of reluctantly there. And there are a number of different things that need to happen. And in fact, we're just launching a campaign as we speak, um, which is sort of internally called, you know, Facebook shop, stop showing our private parts. Um, <laughs> but, but essentially, you know, there are a number of different things that they need to do. For instance, the question of anonymity or pseudonymity is absolutely vital for activists. Um, a concierge service so that activists don't go in the mix of 550 million people when their, their, their account gets disabled because it breaches terms of service. Um, converting to HTTPS, for instance, so that the platform is secure as opposed to HTTP. Um, so they're kind of the blind, turning a blind eye in a sense. And then there are the companies that are the, the, the active, actively negative. And I, would, and I mentioned them before, I think Nokia sailed to Iran, for instance, and their ongoing relationship with Trovacor is a major issue. Um, but it's being replicated with Vodafone, for instance, who said, you know, we're not really responsible. I mean, we're responsible, we had no choice. Well, I mean, I would push back on that. And I think that's absolutely vital that corporations understand the human rights, tech companies understand the human rights implications of the work that they're doing. Um, and there needs to be new guidelines and principles and laws to be able to govern them in the US context uh, as well. For instance, the deep packet inspection stuff where you're actually able to intercept um, data. Um, the government is able to intercept data as a, governments are as a result of this technology. So, Brett, if at this point we can point to someone like Nokia or point to Vodafone, which was one of the organizations in Egypt that shut off the internet, quite mm -hmm. literally. Uh, from January 20th to about six days later. And if we can look at an organization like Facebook, which is doing some of the right things, but seems to be doing it haltingly or hesitantly, is there anyone who's sort of emerged as a model for how to do this right? Is there anyone that we can sort of point to and say, mm -hmm. this is a direction we want more people to move in? Um, I mean, I think Google's step, very brave step, uh, that came um, with the announcement of the hacking of their accounts by the, Ch by the Chinese government or by patriot patriotic hackers, um, and, was, and their announcement that they were no longer going to, to censor the searches. I mean, I think that was a very, very brave and pivotal, pivotal moment. My concern is that other corporations didn't come in behind them, like for instance, Yahoo um, or Microsoft. I think that there's, there, we, as users, and this is one of the things that we've been doing, is trying to create a global movement for digital freedom to influence corporations so that every time they're making decisions, they're not just thinking about the business outcomes, but they're also thinking about the principles. Um, I think that Twitter's response to the WikiLeaks stuff in terms of their not handing over of data um, with, with this, their subpoena policy was really great, and I think it sent a very strong message that corporations um, have got this treasure trove of information that we give them. We give them our names, our credit card details, you know, everything. Um, and they have a responsibility to protect that. So what we're really seeing in some cases is sort of a need to ask corporations, and often US corporations, to take an actual stance and defend rights. Sometimes it's, it's actually just asking these corporations uh, to try very hard to make sure that they're actually accessible in the places that we're talking about. Uh, so we, we've talked about the fact that Facebook, despite the fact that it's blocked in Vietnam, uh, manages to be enormously popular. Uh, and uh, to the point where uh, there were viral videos asking people uh, how to access it. Um, Malcolm Gladwell memorably penned an article a, a, a couple of months ago essentially telling us not to expect revolution uh, coming from Facebook or from any of these online networks because what they do is link together uh, people who are connected only by weak ties rather than by the strong ties that he believes are, are necessary for activism. In the context of Vietnam, which Secretary Clinton pointed to yesterday as one of the most dangerous places in the world uh, to be politically active online, um, how important, how powerful is something like Facebook? Yeah, I mean, I think Gladwell makes some, some really thought-provoking points in his article, but what if in some societies the ties that people have are weaker than social media? So if you go to social media, maybe that's an upgrade in ties. Um, and in, in Gladwell's article, I mean, he has a, uh, a few you know, examples from the, the U.S. civil rights movement um, and, and some current examples. But for instance, if, if most of us here join a, you know, Save Darfur Facebook group. It really doesn't require much of a sacrifice on our part. We're not doing anything dangerous. We're not really sticking our necks out. And, you know, in most cases, it's slacktivism. And we kind of forget that we joined the group. But in a place like Vietnam, uh, when someone joins a, 
um, environmental group to protest bauxite mining or joins one of those uh, protest groups to, you know, because the government's blocking Facebook, they're actually sticking their neck out and they're doing something a lot stronger than they normally would. So I think social media is galvanizing people. Um, another example is, you know, Gladwell was talking about how in the U.S. South, on a given Sunday in the 50s and 60s, 95% of the black population went to church. So the minister wouldn't need to tweet his congregation, he could just stand up on Sunday morning. But what if in certain societies you don't have you know, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, people don't get together like that, and maybe it's through the public town square of Facebook that you have a congregation come together. So, so I think in, in some cases where you actually have weaker ties in society, that social media can be an, an upgrade. So I think if we look at it that way, um, it, it's, it's, it's rising. It, it's helping people come together. So uh, essentially, in, in a case where social media may be the main space in which yeah. you can organize, social media suddenly becomes a way for, g give us a sense for, um, concretize that risk for <clears> us. I mean, you, you basically mentioned that signing up for Facebook is, is perhaps a risky activity in Vietnam. Help us understand sort of what these risks that people are taking in being active online in Vietnam and the current political culture. Sure, I mean, uh, just, just a little bit of context. I mean, if you go back to the digital prehistoric times of the 1990s, uh, people in Vietnam who wanted to get information got it from a loudspeaker um, on their neighborhood block through state media, um, and then if you had a shortwave radio through the BBC and Voice of America, that's basically their information. Nowadays, you have um, you know, a third of the population online. That's not high compared to Western standards, but that's a tremendous amount of people online. And of those people online, about a million are creating their own content through blogs and so forth. So you have people accessing information, and you have people creating content. And that's, that's pretty revolutionary. And what, the way the government has been restricting the internet in Vietnam is through filters, you know, blocking various sites, um, through um, hacking, because now that people are finding ways to go be out beyond the filters, they're actually attacking the sites that people want to access that happen to be on service outside of, outside of Vietnam, and through you know, arresting, persecuting bloggers. But that's still a relatively small population, because not everyone is you know, a political dissident. But I think what has changed in Vietnam the last year or two is when the government went after Facebook, they're now looking at basically the normal average young person who uses Facebook. And that's the same demographic we have here in the United States. So it's, a lot of times it's, it's the children in the leadership, the grandchildren in the leadership, and that's a big dilemma for the government, how they can block Facebook. And, and this was the dilemma that Tunisia faced as well, where even though Facebook was obviously becoming a channel that information was coming out on, Tunisia at a certain point concluded that with 19% of the population on Facebook, they would simply bring more people out into the streets if they were able to block it at that point. Secretary Clinton referred to this yesterday as the dictator's dilemma, but mm -hmm. in many cases, that seems to be the case that governments are playing through. Do they want to make these technologies accessible because they know that they're part of the modern society, or are they finding a way to shut them down because of fear for, for where they'll go? Um, Solana, we were just talking in the green room before this about um, a very concrete problem that we're facing. Uh, Global Voices has been doing a lot of original reporting on Tunisia, on Egypt, now on Algeria, Libya, Yemen, uh, Iran, Gabon, and I apologize to any protests that I've missed today because there's rather a few going on. We've been coordinating that coverage through uh, a remarkable woman, Amira al Hussani. Uh, who is our uh, Middle East and North Africa editor who's based in Manama, Bahrain. And uh, you gave me the rather tragic news that uh, she no longer has any internet access as of a couple of hours yeah. ago. Yeah. What are we going to do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've been, you know, clutching my laptop constantly for the past uh, two months almost. Um, Amira sent out a tweet on Twitter through her cell phone saying, <coughs> Uh, please email the Global Voices Middle East mailing list, tell them I'm offline. Um, which basically means that I and several others, especially the Middle East team, is going to try and pick up the slack and try and figure out what's going on in Bahrain while the Bahrainis are offline. Um, and we don't know how long it will last, maybe it's just a hiccup. Um, for the past several days, their internet has been slowed down to a crawl. Um, they haven't switched it off, but they've made it very, very difficult to access the internet. Um, and so what we do, essentially, is, is to try and, you know, organizations like Brett will do things to try and help people get online again. Um, and we'll work with the Middle East team to try and call on the phones or, or to try and figure out what, what information is there. 
So, so how did that play out, for instance, in Egypt, where really at the height of these protests, uh, we saw five, six days where the internet was simply entirely shut off, or almost entirely shut off within the country, nor group managed, uh, one of the six ISPs in the country managed to keep some of its connectivity up. Mm -hmm. um, how do Global Voices handle a situation like that? How do you get information out of a country when a, when a country takes a step that, that well, it's, it's It's hugely complicated, um, but, but one of the things, one of the sort of unintentional advantages of a country switching the internet off is that the rest of the world suddenly becomes very aware of them. Um, it becomes a media story that the country has switched the internet off. And, you know, a country like Bahrain that has had protests, you know, I'm sure half the people in the room didn't really know that that was happening or maybe still don't really know where Bahrain is. But the day that they switch their internet off, everybody will do a story about it because we're all interested and curious about it. So what happens when the media attention grows and the audience for what's happening grows is that the activists on the ground get incentivized to start posting more information and putting more stuff out there. So actually, um, Tunisia was uploading things, protesting, doing things for a whole month before mainstream media really caught on to what was happening. On Global Voices, we were covering it since mid-December and wondering why the media wasn't picking up the story. The minute that the, you know, the dictator leaves the building, everybody picks up on the story. Egypt had a different situation, different uh, place in geopolitics, but also, uh, you know, I think a lot of the media didn't want to miss the story once more because you got a sense, wow, okay, this could be something more. So when they switched the internet off, I think the global attention that came with that actually helped uh, create a lot more activity both on the ground but also from other activists in the Middle East. So earlier today we were talking about, you know, an activist in New York who could help over the internet. But a lot of what we're seeing now and what is also clear from some of the reporting you see in the New York Times about how were these protests organized is that people are talking to each other across borders. I mean, let's be clear that people in other countries than the United States know how to use the internet. And there are hackers in the Middle East and there are you know, people who can help each other and who speak the same language and who are communicating and who trust each other who are part of that network. I mean, that network also encompasses people here, um, encompasses people from the Global Voices Network. And so a lot of what we've built up um, and what you're also beginning to build up is a global network of people who know each other, trust each other, and who are working together. And ours happens to be very, very strongly based in those countries where people are. So the Moroccans picked up the slacks when the, when the Egyptians got offline. Um, the Syrians chipped in. Uh, people from Yemen were blogging, trying to cover the information that was coming out through cell phones, through NOR, through dial-up connections, through all the different methods that people found to get around those, those uh, blocks. So, so Brett, talk a little bit about um, whether this parallels or doesn't parallel the situation you saw in Iran in 2009, where you got very involved with trying to help people involved with the Green Movement deal with um, a situation where there was a great deal of global attention, the whole world watching, which unfortunately isn't the case on all of the protests that we're watching at the moment. But in Iran, very much a, a, a huge appetite for that information, but also a really severe slowdown, as well as this sort of specter of surveillance that mm. people were deeply worried about. Yeah. I mean, I think that there, we talked about the digital activists and the human rights defenders around the world learning from each other and supporting each other. There's actually a narrative that's happening between dictators and between regimes as well. It's the same kind of... It doesn't happen through global voices. <laughs> we, we try to avoid it. Yes. <laughs> Unless there's some serious infiltration. But so there is certainly lessons that have been learned. And I think that the Egyptian shutdown was a lesson that was learned from that there was, wasn't sufficient response in the Tunisian situation. And I think in the Iranian example, <coughs> um, you know, you just have an incredibly sophisticated. Iranian cyber army and surveillance um, infrastructure that has been translated from being offline to being online. I mean, it's you know, decades of of development, and the Iranian regime, of course, was particularly is was partic had particularly invested in the digital sphere, 
Um, you also have a population <coughs> which is 70% under the age of 25. Um, and so uh, I think that, um, I mean, it's different, you know, like it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say, but I think there's, there's many r things that are replicated. Um, the, the censoring of particular important site, pivotal sites uh, and independent news and media and blog sites. Um, the DDoS attacking, the, like, you know, there's 20 or 30 important um, information sources that run in and out of the country and the government just attacks them. Like, it's extraordinary. You watch those DDoS attacks. They come through the system. Um, and, 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 and it's combined with other components as well, like the partnership with corporations, uh, offline intimidation as well, jailing, for instance, of bloggers. Um, so, you know, all the dirty tricks are used in various different forms and manners in different countries. John, do you want to know? I did, Ethan. I wonder if I might put my former moderator hat on and ask you a question, actually, since sure. you know more about this than most of us added up together. <laughs> um, so one way to look at these stories that we've just heard is that they follow, roughly speaking, a pattern. I wonder if the pattern sounds right, and if so, what should we do about it? So the pattern might be that we get very excited about the use of these technologies, high density um, populations in certain areas, particularly young people, whichever country, um, activists get somewhat more savvy, it's still elite, but people do things with it. The state says, no, I don't want this, I crack down, varying between some very small amount of censorship, plus surveillance, plus DDoS, and so forth, so a variety of responses, right? So activists then go to the you know, ways to get around it, proxies and circumvention and so forth, and then the state comes back and says we're actually going to block the circumvention tools, right? Or in the more extreme form like Burma or Egypt, shut the whole network down and so forth and, and, and kind of back and forth. So is that really the story, that we're just sort of going back and forth? Um, and if so, I, I also am just so interested in the, the um, back and forth with Evgeny Morozov, someone who's written a book recently, The Net Delusion, that's a little like the Malcolm Gladwell thing we've been talking about. And I think he very heavily is weighing in on the side saying, um, all of you excited people are basically deluded, right? This is more or less better for the dictator than it is for the activist. And so I think we kind of keep going back and forth between this yay internet and this, no, it's better for tyrants, right? Um, is that the story and is that the way to see it? Well, so what John is outlining here is a, a very technical argument and I, I um, <coughs> I, I hate to get you know, sort of deep into the technical terms of it, but we tend to refer to this argument as whack-a-mole. Uh, and essentially what happens is every time um, governments crack down and try to constrain speech in one fashion or another, activists find some way to get around it. And we see the government escalate, we see activists escalate, we simply move in a stepwise fashion. Um, I think for several years that sort of idea dominated the discourse. And I think for a long time, uh, folks perhaps on our side of the equation who sometimes are accused of being cyber utopian, and we certainly are in comparison to someone like Morozov, um, believing that the creativity of the people building these circumvention tools are always going to ensure that we're one step ahead. I would say that in the last couple of years, I've gotten a bit more depressed about this, actually. And one of the things, we released a study at the Berkman Center, uh, which I think you co-authored, uh, and, and I think I co-authored too. Uh, so it was a setup. Okay, it, it, it was, was a setup. Set uh, essentially <laughs> saying that um, we tried to take a really good guess at what percentage of people in a country like Vietnam or a country like Iran are using these circumvention tools to get around internet filtering, uh, and we came up with a maximum es estimate of three percent, um, and a minimum estimate that's almost an order of magnitude smaller than that. And essentially saying that, yes, there's a small group of activists who are finding ways to use these tools and get around censorship, but it's actually a fairly small group. I think we might you know, offer that uh, perhaps in defense of, of uh, Morozov's argument and essentially say, you know, yeah, there are tools out there, but in fact, you know, maybe they're counterbalanced by this ability to do surveillance, by the ability to watch things. I think what's so exciting about developments very recently is that what we're figuring out is that it's a mistake to look at the internet by itself. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting about the internet is in this larger context of a media environment. The internet is making it possible for people who normally don't get heard, normally don't get their voices on television or into the newspaper to raise a voice, even if it's through a very, very narrow channel. Even if it's as ludicrous as someone making a phone call on a landline on speak to tweet to try to find a way to raise their voice in Egypt, once you have the attention to the situation, 
you then have the possibility that the internet ends up being an input into a larger media dialogue. And we're also starting to see the idea that that larger shift in the media, when you have the sense that major change is possible, it's possible that that broadcast media environment, watching a dictator fall in Al Jazeera, may actually have the impetus of flooding lots, lots more people into trying to use these tools. Now, let me say there's immediately sort of two problems that I think we're perhaps not talking about or not thinking about with this. The first is that it only works if you're paying attention to it. Uh, it only works if people are watching Egypt. It doesn't work so well in Gabon, where we have people taken to the streets and being brutally put down by a government, which simply knows that no one's going to pay any attention to it. The second is that it only works if the tools let you do this. And this is maybe one of the biggest fears that we have out here. Facebook, which deserves a great deal of praise for the fact that it seems to have been a key technology in this, has a terrible, terrible track record of taking down groups that were put up by people using pseudonyms. And it makes perfect sense to use a pseudonym if you're organizing in Syria. And Facebook at some point is going to have to confront and deal with that. So my hope is that we're somehow getting beyond uh, that sort of whack-a-mole debate and we're starting to get into a new complicated situation that we may not know uh, enough about yet simply because these, these ideas are unfolding in real time. But let, let's use this as a moment to, to open up the conversation since you're going to open it up by shifting the moderator role. Uh, can we get some, <laughs> some, back, some questions sorry. to these uh, remarkable folks that we have on stage who are really trying in, in real time uh, to, uh, to, to put the promise of this technology into action? I'm going to rely on you to, to point to people, Jenny, because I can barely see in the audience at this point. Hi. Um, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I work at Global Integrity on the Indaba Project. Um, thank you for all coming. And I think the last frame of sort of the, the utopian versus dystopian vision of, of this technology, that the stuff that connects us can also be used to hunt us down and punish us for organizing. Um, the whack-a-mole, I think, is, is largely correct, but that also implies that an arms race is on. And I think just recently, governments have realized, well, now we have to pay attention to this. So I think the, the, countervent or the, the countermeasures that we're seeing, DDoS, uh, uh, turning the internet off entirely, that kind of thing is a really crude and early version of what we're going to see later. And we're going to see things like attacks on reputation systems and trust networks and, and basically spamming information flows uh, that are going to be much, much more sophisticated, more subtle, and more hidden than just turning off an entire country's internet. And then on the other side of that, there's the next phase of, of countermeasures and, and not just specific like, oh, here's a software that we're going to use, but underlying structural concerns with how we use technology and how we use networks that are going to tip the balance back towards the people on the, the good side of the whack-a-mole phenomenon. And I want to open it up to you guys as what do you see as like the big structural issues underneath all these technologies that are going to help keep things on the, the side where the people trying to share information and, and put out good quality information are, are winning. Great, thanks. And so I, I, I'm going to break that question up in, in two, actually, because we've got, I think, the right people to address. I, I'm going to ask Zui first to sort of talk about how Vietnam, which is really one of the most aggressive yeah. and sophisticated countries in attacking speech online. G give us sort of the state of the art. I mean, give us, you know, frankly, what, what Viet Thanh is experiencing. Well, I mean, the government definitely doesn't like, you know, free speech online. And so um, it's, it resorts to a, you know, a variety of means. I mean, it, it arrests bloggers, it intimidates bloggers. And a lot of times, it'll go after the families of bloggers because, you know, the blogger will be very stubborn. But if the blogger's mother or father loses their job or the residency permit, that is a, uh, you know, a way to intimidate. Um, and then now it's, it's starting to use um, a lot of malware, spyware. Um, almost every day I get an email that is obviously having a virus uh, for me to, to, lo to load. Um, and there's, there's these means to basically monitor people uh, using computers. But I don't feel like that is creating incremental dangers to us because in closed societies, I mean, the government is already watching you. They're watching you through neighbor neighborhood wardens. They're already, you know, following you. So, this is really an opportunity for us to have the technologies. And I think going back to his question, this, this a, a, structurally is the people up here, I mean, not me, but you four have done a lot of thinking in terms of circumvention technologies. And we can find ways to provide it to you know, countries such as 
uh, Iran or Vietnam, that's going to go a long way. So, John, you're as knowledgeable as anybody in this room about the structure of the internet and, and this sort of hope that the white hats in the end are going to win out. Um, do you buy it? Um, do, do you think the internet is fundamentally architected in such a way that this form of control, either by governments or at other choke points, um, is, is eventually doomed to failure? I don't. I, I don't think there's anything predetermined. I think we've got a series of narratives that we can understand that have happened, but I also just think it's green fields ahead of us. The, the number one thing we can do, I think, is to focus on the human capacity. I think that this is the, the topic that in some ways is underlying a lot of these conversations. It's if, in fact, the skills and the peer-to-peer -peer transmission of skills and the human network between all of these people who are trying to figure out what's going on, that's the answer, I think, to this. And it's in part because the environment itself is not just um, human beings doing things on it, but human beings are actually affecting the network itself as we use it. And it, I think it goes back to the coders as writers thing. We are scripting and using the technology all the time. So I, I invest in people. So let's take another question. Over here, maybe? Okay. Hi, it's uh, Gigi Sohn again. I was wondering if you could um, comment on the piece of legislation I talked about this morning that, that is about to be introduced in the U.S. Senate that would allow the U.S. government to go into foreign countries and seize domain names and uh, block the resolution of, of, domain, uh, of domain name requests. And if you could just talk about what are the international implications if the U.S. government could do those kind of things. Brett, do you want to take that one on? Yeah, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I think it's important to recognize that this is not just a, a US phenomenon. It's actually like the European police, the European parliament is currently considering a directive, I think it is, to look at the ability to um, <clears throat> um, disable particular IPs, um, particular websites. Um, and, you know, often the problem, of course, is that it's wrapped up in a kind of national security debate or it's wrapped up in a question around pornography and, it's or, and or copyright. Case, yeah. And or copyright. I think these are the three. And the problem, of course, that we have and the problem that in, in the Australian context, because Australia was, has on the books um, and was almost passed and may still get passed through the national parliament, is a mandatory filtering system. And the problem that I see is that this is about infrastructure, about creating the infrastructure, the legal and technical infrastructure to enable this sort of thing to happen, and then mission creep. So it starts off being for national security or for copyright or whatever it might be, and then it almost would be wrong for a government in a national security situation not to inf use that infrastructure if it was in place. Like, it, the, the sort of, it gets turned. And so, um, my, uh, I'm not a fay with the precise details of the copyright thing. I think I'm one of those people that kind of, you know, runs from it a little. But my response to it is that we need a movement of users. You know, we actually need to influence parliamentarians or congressmen or whoever it might be um, to say that as users that we're not in support of that. So let's take a final question. Over here, Brett. So uh, I work on transparency and government accountability here at the Ford Foundation. And I, I'm struck by how fluid this whole environment is that we're hearing about. Um, in the work that we're doing, there's a, you, we're seeing great advances in right to know legislation in various countries, particularly in the developing world. Um, there, but then we're seeing um, pushbacks on right to association, right to form unions. We're seeing these issues about free, um, free speech rights versus the right to have corporate interests bury your messages because they can buy elections and those kinds of things. I'm wondering um, if you're seeing any kind of movement, and I think this follows from the last comment and from maybe some of your work, John and Ethan, um, with this younger generation, if there's kind of a movement for a right to communicate um, that would feed into accessibility, affordability, having, I mean, is there, uh, do, you, do you see these people who are digital, who grew up being digital natives, kind of having a different attitude and way of thinking about this so that it becomes perhaps another rights-based movement in terms of having access to the mechanisms by which people communicate. So I, I'm going to put this question to Solana, who on a daily basis is interacting with about 400 digital natives who are trying to explain this phenomenon in their countries. Do, do, do you see this as a movement? Do you see yeah, this as I, a shift? I mean, 
I, I don't think it's been articulated as a movement, but what we see in a lot of these uprisings, so, you know, even when they get called sort of overambitiously Facebook movements or Twitter movements or whatever, is there isn't an ideology attached. There aren't any figureheads. Um, you, people don't really understand or know what they want because they don't have spokespersons. So what they're, what they're doing and what they're trying to achieve is exactly a, a kind of an open process. I mean, they're not even referring to it as democracy, which is something I think very new. Um, it's, it's, they want openness, they want transparency, they're not looking for power, they're not looking to elevate a certain amount of people. They're even willing to work with their political rivals in order to achieve those goals. And it's, it's, it's not ideology, but it's a very strong sense of idealism, which, you know, I, we'll, we'll see if it's proven wrong if it fails miserably, I would be very surprised if it had the same outcome in all these countries that we're seeing, but it's definitely true that they are um, connecting in the way that they organize, in the way that they have identified their criteria of success is something new and something that belongs to this means and, and way of communication. And, and if I were to put a, a single turn on it, I, I would put out the word participation. Yeah. Um, Possibly the most inspiring and, and maybe sort of stunning story to me in the last couple of months has been the story of um, a good friend of ours, actually a contributor to Global Voices, Slim Amamu, um, who uh, on a Thursday found himself arrested uh, for his blogging activities. Uh, on a Tuesday found himself released, and on Wednesday found himself the Minister of Youth and Culture of Tunisia. <laughs> and needless to say, this is not an easy transition to make. <laughs> and, and it was not in fact a smooth transition for Slim, and, and many of his friends in Tunisia uh, gave him a very, very hard time about joining a government that included a lot of elements of the previous regime. And Slim's response was basically to say, look, I've been looking for ways to change my country. Mm -hmm. This is the way in which I can do it. And his friends in the end ended up saying, absolutely. And you know what? The way that we can change our country is by building an independent media. And we're going to watch you like a hawk, buddy, <laughs> even if you happen to be our friend. And what I think is wonderful about what's going on now and in a lot of the countries that we're working in is not necessarily access to data, not necessarily transparency but the assumption that we are all moving parts within this, whether that means taking to Tahrir Square or whether it means finding ways to write about this and be transparent about it. Yeah. So thank you for this chance to talk about it and thanks to our wonderful panel. <laughs> <laughs>